Good morning. Okay, let's dive in. How many of you like hard instruction? Yeah, there we go. Things that are difficult to understand. When I was in high school, I confess I was always looking for the easy classes, the easy lessons. How many of you have your favorite subject? Yeah, mine was band. <laughs> so my last, my last year of school, I took it in four classes. Four classes of band. I was learning everything about my trumpet. Love that class. I also kind of like math. Uh, that was easier than English and writing and grammar and all of those things and speaking. So I took all the math classes because they were easy. The hard ones, oh, no. Do everything you can to avoid hard classes. That was my motto, just being honest. I wanted the easiest path, the least resistance, the least amount of work. But as I grew up, I learned some of the hardest lessons in school or work, or life, were some of the most fruitful. When I struggled through hard lessons, I found a true joy and glory on the other side. These hard lessons caused me to work hard and study and depend upon God's grace more and more and more in my life. Today's instruction from the Lord is one of his hard lessons to the apostles. It's not one that we would all sign up for if we were picking our messages. We probably in our flesh would have said, I think I could skip today. Let's go with an easier message. It's funny, some of you have brought your family members here to be with you today too. Uh, just ironic here, we're going to be talking about that and how important it is. Our flesh will not like today's message. If we want the easy way, today's instruction will not be appreciated. But listen closely, beloved. Today's message is actually the hardest good news we will ever receive. It's worth the struggle to understand. It's worth the pain it takes to accept and embrace this truth. Jesus' instruction is hard, but worth embracing with all of our hearts. Again, we're in the middle of Jesus instructing his 12 apostles on how they are supposed to spread the good news that the kingdom is near, to tell people that Jesus has arrived, the king is here, the kingdom is near, repent for Jesus is here. The nearness of kingdom is here. And he tells them to go out and tell the people, instruct the people about this good news. And in the process, as he instructs them, he starts to tell them some things that just wouldn't be what most teachers would tell their students. It goes contrary to a lot of what they might have thought. I just wonder, I have to admit, that after they, as they heard some of these words and as they went through some of these words, I wonder how many times they went away shaking their heads, going, what? What do you mean by this? How? This is what it's all about? We'll talk about this as we go along today. I want to summarize again, and I am summarizing the instruction of Jesus, and we've made our way through this chapter. We've seen in exhortations for his disciples to embrace in order that they exalt him in this age before his kingdom comes. First, we saw that they must be wise yet innocent like doves, right? Second, we saw don't worry because the Spirit will work. 
Third, we saw understand the times, and this was kind of a preview to what we're going to talk about more today and how we're supposed to respond to the times. And then fourth, don't fear man, but trust the sovereign God. That's what we talked about last week and how he went through this whole section about not fearing man, but trusting the God who is with us and over us and controlling all things. Jesus told the apostles in verse 26, notice, don't fear man, instead announce the truth with courage. Because God's judgment's coming, it's all going to be revealed, just proclaim the truth. Announce it with courage and boldness. Don't fear man. Then in verse 28, he said, don't fear man who can kill the body, but fear God who can kill both body and soul in hell. And his point is real simple. They may kill your body. You may be persecuted. You may be hurt. But ultimately remember who is God and who controls and is over the soul and our eternity. Those are important truths for us to know and embrace. Don't fear man who can kill the body, but fear God who can kill both body and soul in hell. And finally, last week we saw, last Sunday, Jesus exhorted the apostles, don't fear man or circumstances, but trust God because he values his own. In verses 29 to 31, we saw these words. Look at it. In 29, are not two sparrows sold for two a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very heads, hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Beloved, we too, as Jesus' disciples, those who have repented and believed in Him, understand that our God is sovereign. He is the sovereign Lord who values us. He loves us and He cares for us. He loves us so much that He died in our place and rose from the dead to give us life. He's a sovereign, good, good Father. We don't need to have a good self-image, do we, beloved? We need to know God values us. That's what matters. He values us so much that He sent His Son and His Son died for us. We must not trust in ourselves. Instead, we must trust in this sovereign God and Lord. All of this trust and fear of God is based on a full understanding of who God is and how He views us, how God views His adopted children and who God is. That's what we have to think on and understand and be aware of. Telling the apostles that they would suffer before it happened also was evidence that he was sovereign over even the evil that was coming upon them. Do you understand what I mean by this? If he tells them, hey, you're going to possibly die. You are going to be rejected. There are going to be family members that reject you. And you go back to your hometown and you begin to speak the truth and your hometown rejects you. And you go, oh... He knew it was going to happen before it happened. So he is what? Sovereign. He's in control. He's even in control of the evil that comes upon us. All the evil. (laughs) Mom, even when your beautiful little child looks up at you and says something disrespectful (laughs) and doesn't honor you, or your teenager says something rude to you, Dad. Or your coworker does something evil and stabs you in the back. God is sovereign over all evil. Of all things that happen, He's in control. And this was good for them to hear. It was good for them to know. This would become more understandable, as they watch their own Lord and Savior die. 
as he was blasphemed, as he was rejected, as he was brutally beaten, and then horrifically crucified. He was showing that he was sovereign even over the greatest evil act ever that has ever occurred in this world. You understand that Jesus announced this over and over and over. They're going to reject me. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. He told them over and over. He knew it. The scriptures had said it would happen. Jesus knew it was going to happen. Jesus was Lord over this. And as Satan came through Judas to arrest him, he said, your hour is here. Do what you're supposed to do. I can't emphasize this enough, beloved. Walking with Jesus in this world of suffering and pain is absolutely impossible if we don't know and understand that suffering that He endured for us. If we don't understand that God did all this for us, that Christ did this for us, none of today's message is going to make any sense at all. If you do not understand the glory of God in the person and work of Jesus, if you don't get this, this hard message is going to be totally foreign to you. It's not going to make any sense. So I want to challenge you. God is sovereign over all evil as best seen in the cross itself. And we must not fear man, but instead we must fear and trust God. Jesus concludes this call to fear God, not man, with a pair, a pair of life maxims. Uh, two promises to know and embrace. Look at verse 32. Jesus gave the apostles two promises for those who fear and trust Him instead of fearing man. Here's the promises. Therefore, everyone who confesses me Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus gives these promises, these maximums, two short general truths that reveal theological truth and how we should understand the world as disciples and followers of Christ. First, he says, those who trust and proclaim Jesus will be blessed. And second, those who fear man and deny Jesus will be cursed. This is just the facts. This is what he means. Notice the first truth. For those who trust and proclaim Jesus, therefore, therefore... Everybody who trusts and knows that God is sovereign. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Implied by this statement is, everyone who is trusting in God and not fearing man will then proclaim and confess and acknowledge Jesus before men. As we trust God, as we know who He is, as we believe in Him, we will then what? Acknowledge Him. We will confess Him. Out of our hearts that trust Him, automatically what will come out of our mouths is Jesus is Lord. It will just happen. When we're trusting Him, Christ is exalted and confessed. And the promise is, for those who trust and then proclaim Jesus, Jesus will then advocate for us. In the greater eternity, He's mine. She's mine. She's my daughter. I paid for her sin. He's my son. He's my brother. I paid for his sin, Father. And He will advocate for us. He will say, this one is mine. I died for him. Those who trust in Christ will confess Christ, and in Christ will acknowledge us. Wow, that's great truth, isn't it? 
to know that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous? That the one that we trust in, we believe in, he is affirming and advocating for us to the Father. That's good news. Whereas the adversary is always constantly accusing us, isn't he? He's always saying, no, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. I know your sins when you were 19, 20, 21 years old. I know those times. The adversary, the devil, says those things. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And all who believe in him are righteous in God's sight because of him, through faith in him. Oh, what great truth, right? That's enough for us to stop and go home on. Meditate on these truths. It will make you run out of this room yelling, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're not going to have a problem with fear of man if you're fully aware that you have an advocate with the Father. The heart is revealed, however, with what we say and proclaim to others. Notice, however, the second truth. Those who fear man and deny Jesus. He says, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Denial of Jesus before men will mean a future denial of Jesus concerning those who aren't really his. Remember he said in Matthew chapter 7, Depart from me, I never really knew you. Denial of Jesus reflects a heart of unbelief. Now, these are hard truths, aren't they? These are very difficult things to think on. But I want to make something very clear for every one of you. A question for you all. Does this mean... If a person proclaims Jesus to others, they earn Jesus' favor and thus are saved. So in other words, if you go out this week and you think, Hey, I'm going to do a little bit of evangelism. I'm going to tell people about the gospel. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Does that earn you a right standing with God? And therefore he says, Yep, that one's mine. No, that's not what he's saying. Jesus isn't saying sharing the gospel earns a person's salvation, his advocacy. This whole section, however, can be misunderstood if we get these things backwards. If we don't have a proper understanding of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you're going to mix this up. You're going to go out of here thinking, I've got to be a better person. I've got to confess Jesus more so that he will then advocate for me. And you'll miss it. That's not what he's saying. Out of the heart flows the abundance of the lips, the tongue, right? What comes out of the heart, that's what we confess. If we believe in him, we will then confess him. If we've already been saved, if we've already been regenerate, if we've already been born again, we will then confess him and show and demonstrate that we are his children, his disciples. Jesus is speaking of the fruit of a right relationship with him. Jesus is not talking about the root of a right relationship with him, as we saw in the movie on Friday night. Now, if you don't have, if you're here and you don't have a right relationship with him, these verses should absolutely crush you. They should. They should bring a fear over your soul, you should be like, wait a second, I don't confess Jesus much. I don't acknowledge Jesus' lordship. I'm not telling people about him. You should be saying in your hearts, my love for Jesus is not at this level. And so I'm a sinner. 
And I need him. I need him to be my savior. And you should cry out to him right now. Please save me, Lord. Everybody in this room that doesn't know him as their savior and Lord and isn't confessing him, not evidencing this kind of fruit, there's a problem with your heart. You need to cry out to him right now. You need to cry out and say, Lord, please save me. If you do do that, if you seek him, he will forgive you. He will make you his child. You will be forgiven. That's good news, isn't it? I mean, you, you don't have to walk an aisle in this church. You don't have to pray a prayer. You have to believe. You have to trust in him. You've got to turn from your sins and look to Christ Jesus, believing that he died for you. Now, for the believers in this room, I don't know about you, but these verses still kind of crush me. How about you? Anybody sin this week? You don't need to raise your hand. If you did, at that moment, you were denying him. Maybe it's not the direction of your life. Maybe it's not the way... Maybe you're not always doing this. Yeah, because God rebirthed you but you still need the gospel i find it so ironic that peter is being spoken to and peter will then deny him what three times does that mean that jesus then denied jesus or denied peter in eternity no why Because the righteousness of Peter is not what got him to heaven. It was the righteousness of Christ credited to Peter's account when he repented and believed in Jesus. He was declared right even though he was still in his body of death that was still prone to sin. These Maxims, these truths should crush every one of us in the room all the time. They crush me this week again. Hard truths. But one thing is sure. There was nowhere to turn to myself to save me. There was nowhere to turn to sanctify me. There was only one. And his name is Jesus, the worthy one. He died for me. He's my righteousness. Not how good I confess him. Or not my denials of him and my sin. You're going to hear this over and over today. I hope you're ready to hear it because that's the gospel. (laughs) Because that's what the point of this is. I hope you want to hear Jesus. I hope you want to hear about him more. Because that's what you're going to hear. These truths from Jesus call us to pray, don't they? They call us to look deep within our souls and then look fully at the glory of God and the person and work of Jesus. This is a call to trust in him and depend upon him. This is a call to proclaim our sovereign Lord by grace through faith in Him. So does this courage guarantee victory over all those we engage with the gospel? (laughs) Does this boldness... Okay, I got it. Jesus died for me. I am loved. I'm bought by the king. I'm adopted in his family. Does this courage and this boldness that I now have to announce and proclaim the king, does it mean that everybody I talk to, they're going to say, yeah, I want some of that. I want to know Jesus too. I want some more. Please tell me more. I've got to hear this. 
Keep preaching, Pastor Mike. You can preach for four hours. I got to have more of this. Is that what they're going to say? No. Notice the next truth. Jesus' unexpected ways. Embrace Jesus' unexpected ways. One of our biggest problems as disciples of Jesus is how our thinking has to be totally reconditioned from the world when we're converted. It has to be tr totally transformed. It's almost like everything I thought up to the age of when I was a believer or became a believer, almost everything I thought, the opposite was true. I actually viewed the world totally backwards. And the sad thing is, is that as I walk in this planet and the longer I walk in this journey with the Lord and enjoying Him, the more I realize as I study the Scriptures, I still have these areas where I think totally backwards of the way God thinks. That His ways and His thoughts are opposite to mine. Anybody else in the room? I mean, this is, this is like a weekly battle I have. Really? This is, this is what you want? This is, this is how it is? No. No way. The world's... Nah. -uh. No. How many of you wrestle with God? Really? I feel more like Jacob every day. Don't you? And the world that we're living in is constantly speaking into our lives too. Everywhere you look, you're, you're reading it, you're seeing it, you're viewing it, you're watching it. You're being told it from coworkers or friends or family or neighbors. Everybody, the world is constantly telling you the opposite of what is true. <laughs> They're constantly telling you all these lies and all these things that are not right. And you're bombarded continuously. And you don't even realize it. We don't, do we? Sometimes we're like, yeah, that can't be. Not, that's not God. No way. That's not what he wants. Yeah, the shocking ones, right? But there's all the subtle stuff that's going on, too. That you have uh, The enemy is trying to brainwash us and get us to think the opposite of the way Jesus thinks. So then you come to a passage like this, 34 to 39, and you say, wait a second. What? This isn't it, is it? I think this is the apostles. i got to believe the first time they heard these truths and these things, they had to shake their heads at times as they walked away. What we think is the right way to go is often the wrong way to go. What we think is the right priorities in our life are actually the wrong priorities in our life. What we think is most important in our life is often leading to our death. As Jesus sends his disciples out, again, I'm convinced they were clueless to much of what he was saying. It took him getting all the way to the cross, dying, rising from the dead, the Spirit coming for them to really, oh, boom, all of it comes alive. Think about this. These Jewish fishermen, farmers, tax collectors, following him, he says, they announce, this is the one. This is the Messiah. This is the one we're looking for. What were they looking for? They were looking for the Prince of Peace, weren't they? Were they looking for the Prince of Peace? Yeah. They were looking for the one their parents had possibly told them about. The one that their parents probably told them would rescue them from the tyranny of Rome. 
and oppression. They were looking for the one that would restore Israel. (laughs) They were looking for the Messiah that was going to make life on earth a lot better. I mean, if the king is here, then the kingdom is coming soon. And the nations are going to come and bow at the Messiah's feet. Isn't that what Zechariah and Isaiah say? They were thinking it. Weren't they thinking it? If they knew their Bibles at all, and their parents were anything of good at teaching the Bible, they were teaching this. So the arrival of the Messiah had to be one of one who would restore Israel to its position of authority and glory, the apple of God's eye. But Jesus instead throws a big bucket of cold water on him. (laughs) With these words, I mean, look at them. And beloved, if we're all honest, starting in verse 34, these aren't the first choice either for words that we want to live by. Especially if we're still living dead in sin. If you're lost, you still, you really won't like these words. Jesus says, in effect, my ways are not your fleshly ways. My thoughts are not how the world thinks. However, beloved, this is the gospel. Hear me. This is the good news. It's not fleshly good news but a spiritual good news. It's the true good news for all of us. And it requires amazing grace for us to understand and embrace. So, let's look at it. We'll walk through it real quick. First, there's three three of Jesus' unexpected ways. Look at them first. Jesus' purpose, 34 to 36. Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. What? (laughs) I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay. He's an NRA. He's, He's with the NRA here, but with a sword. For, for, look at this. He says, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Wait a second. This doesn't look like the kingdom. This doesn't look like the kingdom what we were looking for. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? I, I mean, y'all sing it every Christmas. To bring peace on earth and goodwill to man. Didn't he? Well, actually, did did the angels say that? No. They didn't say that. They said this, listen closely. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Whoa, throw that last phrase out. Peace with those whom he is pleased. Peace among those God is pleased with. Peace with those whom God has given unmerited favor to. Grace to. But this isn't for everybody at that time. In fact, most of the world would reject Him. Most of the world hated him. 
When Jesus came into the world, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, as John states. Yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. Whoa! Hold on. Where is the peace and unity and good news, good kindness for everybody? In fact, Jesus says, He did not come, in our passage, He did not come to bring peace on earth, but instead He came to bring a sword. What? Yet, He never raised the sword, did He? No, He didn't. And in fact, when one of His disciples, clueless, Pulls out the sword and says, I got him. I'll take them all by myself. And cuts off the ear of not the one he should have. There's this guy standing here beside him. Jesus does what? He rebuked him. Wait. I, I, I. I wonder if Peter, as he's walking back, you know, you know, he fled and he's following him from this. Wait a second, didn't he say, didn't he say a sword? He said, brought the, came to bring a sword. I mean, didn't one other time he told us, hey, get two swords and get ready. Or get, get your sword, get your sword and get ready because you're going to have to travel. His point was not that we're going to go make war with them. He's saying, look, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. You're in a rough time. His purpose was to bring a sword. What does he mean? Jesus explains it in the next phrase. He says, I came to set man against people or others. Set people. That's what he means by the sword. I came to set people against each other. Wow. Wow. Isn't this shocking? Again, if you grew up here in the Sunday school messages, you might get this idea that, you know, hey, let's just all come together. Everything's going to be good. This is going to be a great time. Let's do it. Let's all get along. Because after all, the kids come play together, and the kids are, you know, whenever one of them's mean to the other ones, we correct them real quick, and kids get along decently here. It's a fun place. What is this? The family unit in Jewish culture was very important. Respect one's parents was not an option. If you did not respect, you suffered shame. Sons were willing to die for their fathers. To respect them and honor them and do whatever they said, whenever they said it, all the time. Why? Because you're going to honor them. Daughters were willing to do anything their mother said. Clean up. Yes, ma'am. Boom. They do it. Immediately. You're like, you have ulterior motives in how you're preaching this? (laughs) Trying to teach a little respect? Daughters-in-law would bend over backwards to show honor for their mother-in-laws. But Jesus shows up, and commitment to one's family unit is now going to be broken. In that time, you did what your parents said, no matter what, or suffered enormous shame. And the commitment of the parents to their children was just as deep. But here comes Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, saying, I've come to put enmity between parents and their children. This would have made very little sense to them. And it makes very little sense to us unless we understand who we are, and who Jesus is.
See, people, we are born hating God. I know they are beautiful, but they are vipers and diapers. There's one right there. Cute little viper in diaper. They can clean up the outside. They can demonstrate respect. They can look at you. They can smile at you. They can say, yes, sir, dad, I'll do whatever you say. And deep down in their soul, they can hate God with all their heart and hate you for telling them to do anything. I don't have time for this. The only difference is, in our culture today, kids don't care and they just say what's on their hearts. It hasn't changed though, beloved. We might show more respect back 50, 60 years ago. Listen to me closely. But the hearts were just as depraved. It's just like during the time of Jesus, man. They could clean up the outside of that cup and they looked pretty. But they were dead inside. And when the message of Jesus came to that household, guess what? It was repent of your wicked heart and trust in Jesus. And beloved, that doesn't go over real well. It's like a sword, huh? It divides. Ooh. What was Jesus saying? Love me more than your family. Love God. But when Jesus arrived, it was pick a side. Are you going to be a respecter of people or one who will honor God? So, beloved, where are you at? <laughs> Where are you? Is it about what people think of you? Or is it about Jesus Christ alone? The gospel divides, doesn't it, beloved? It's like a big sword. By nature, no one is born wanting to confront their sin and need of a Savior. By nature, no one is born wanting to love God more than their parents. By nature, no one is born wanting to submit to God's rule and reign more than anything or anyone else. No one is born wanting to do this. So when Jesus arrived, He came and separated those whom God would give grace to and those whom God would allow to reject Him. And that's what He did. And He's still doing it today. So the disciples need to understand, as they went out, things were not going to be easy. Even some of their own family members would turn on them, but Jesus was worthy of following. He was worth choosing over their parents and their children if necessary. This whole section is something no other person has said or is able to say without sinning. I want you to hear me. No person has ever or will ever, other than Jesus, can say this phrase that he is saying without sinning. Only Jesus could say, pick me over your family. Love me more than anybody else. Jesus came to divide families. Why? For God's glory. For God's glory and to save his own. The division meant some would be saved. So it was worth it. It was worth it. If everyone was going in the same direction after Jesus came, his mission to rescue some of the perishing would have been a total failure. There had to be some that turned. And the ones that turned would then become the enemies of everybody going the other way.
Why? Because not everybody bows their knee to Jesus. So, beloved, whose side are you on? I would imagine in a group this size, there are some who are against God. Those who love their sin more than they love God. I know this is hard to hear, but God has sent His Son into the world to die for sinners just like you and me. We must turn from our sin and trust in Jesus and be saved. You must repent, you must turn, and you must embrace Jesus. We must submit to Him. We must choose Him over our families. We must choose Him over our lifestyles. We must choose Him over everything. Your job, your career, your 401k, your bank accounts, your friends, everything. He must be better than that. Do you believe? Wow, Mike, come on. This is like the amazing youth message from Paul Washer. None of us can get out of here. We all want to crawl under the chairs, right? Is Jesus Lord or are you his enemy? Beloved, there's hope. (laughs) There's glorious hope. Okay, be honest. How many of you have chose family, friends, things, world over Jesus before in your life? I see that hand. Where's the other? I see that hand. Where's the other? Why isn't everybody in the room raising your hand? You are that man! None of us are innocent. But God. (laughs) But God. Sent his son into the world. He lived the righteous life that I couldn't. He obeyed two sinner parents. He kept the law perfectly. Righteous. Without fault. In his heart, in his mind, and his thoughts, every second of his incarnation. And still does. 100% righteous, holy, perfect, worthy. And then... He obeyed to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he was crushed by the Father to be a propitiation for my sin. (laughs) My sin. And all of my sin was paid for on that cross. For the three hours when the father was judging him, he was judging him for my sin. (laughs) Wow. Wow. (laughs) And he chose me to be his son and his follower. He died, he rose from the dead, he's victorious, he's ruling and reigning in heaven, and one day he will return, and I can't wait. And every second of every day that I'm not honoring him, I pray God spanks me and spanks me hard, because I want to honor him with everything I say all the time, because he's God and he loves me. And I don't want to do anything but to honor Him all the time. 
I want to confess him. I don't ever want to deny him. I love him. And I want to worship him. And I don't want anything but him. And if my son dies, I will be okay. And if I die, I will be okay. And if all of you decide, pastor's got to go, I'll be okay. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's worthy. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Christ Jesus. Lord, oh God, please forgive us. In light of the glory of Christ and all that he has done for us, how in the world could we continue to sin? Oh, God, please forgive us. As we take the Lord's Supper now, Lord, we pray that you will help us to confess our sins because you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Lord, please, please, God, sanctify us. Change us, make us look holy, help us to walk worthy of this amazing calling that you have given us. Father, I pray that if there are some in here that have not believed in you, I pray, Lord, that today is the day that they cry out to you. I pray that they will repent of their weak faith. I pray that we will all turn to you and trust in Jesus alone to save us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We pray this in his name.